Hello everyone. So this time we're going to talk about neoclassical economics and in a lot of ways we can understand neoclassical economics as the main, the dominant, the hegemonic perspective um, today. So if you study economics as a major uh, in many places, I won't say all, um, you will get taught this set of ideas, the ideas we're talking about today, as opposed to any other discussion about the economy. And you'll be taught this in such a way that it's the single correct way to look at the economy. And this is the case in almost every economics department in the world. I say almost, there are definitely exceptions. But um, what we'll see today is that so-called neoclassical economics is really just the combination of a couple of ideas um, that we're going to look at. So we're going to focus on marginalism and monetarism as being two major trends within this perspective. Uh, that have big policy implications um, and that have sort of very much shaped the way the world has worked at least for the last uh, 40 or so years although as we'll see that's starting to decline now so here's some of the fundamental assumptions behind neoclassical economics um, there's three so firstly um, this perspective assumes people's preferences are rational um, and we can identify these preferences with the values that things have right so that's a complicated way of what we call the subjective theory of value. Subjective meaning the things that we individually like, um, that it's just a matter of taste or preference, not, not an objective theory of value, which says there's a way of measuring something independent of our tastes and preferences. Okay, point two, um, this theory assumes that firms maximize profits and people maximize utility, or at least try. They do their best to maximize utility. Finally, that people have free will and that we use this free will to make decisions. And in order to make these decisions, we need full and relevant information to make those decisions about the economy um, in our own little way. So based on all of these things, neoclassical economics is trying to explain how scarce resources get allocated and it'll mostly rely on these principles of supply and demand. So that's why supply and demand are two of the most well-known um, economic concepts, mostly because of the, you know, the dominant position that this way of thinking has occupied in the last little while. So William Stanley Jevons is one of the people we'll study today. Um, he's one of the people who founded this tradition. And he says that well, given a certain population with various needs and powers of production in possession of certain lands and other sources of material required the mode of employing their labor, which will maximize the utility of their produce. And it kind of sums up all of those different points, right? Uh, people need to make stuff, uh, so they do. Um, they employ their labor in a way that maximizes their utility, right? Everybody's trying to make as much profit as possible at all times. Here's Jevons. Um, and more or less, I mean, I, it's kind of reductionist to say this, but uh, more or less, he's famous because he brought mathematical and statistical methods into what used to be political economy and now uh, sort of in the book a general mathematical theory of political economy okay he's also famous for inventing what's known as the marginal utility theory of value um, which you know sort of is a slightly different take on this than the subjective theory of value but not quite um, so utility is basically um, the satisfaction or benefit we get from consuming a thing um, and so the assumption behind this is obviously, if we put together the mathematical statistical side and the utility side, what we're seeing here is that, well, um, utility is kind of meaningless unless we can measure and quantify utility. We've got to be able to decide what utility is. You know, when are people making these decisions about what they get satisfaction for or get benefit from? So that leads us to this principle called diminishing um, marginality um, and how it influences, sorry, marginal utility and how it influences market prices. So diminishing marginal utility suggests that uh, if we've got something and the marginal utility of that thing for us is less than what somebody else has, we're gonna try and trade those things. We're gonna try and convince the person that you know, they should exchange something for, um, for what we've got. Um, and we're gonna attempt to trade what we've got. So this could be anything. It can be our time, it can be our money, it can be our ability to do work, it could be any possession we own. And basically, um, we're going to think of trading that 
if we think what we've got is less valuable than what we can get. Okay. So the argument here is that if we have more of something, that's going to lower the utility of any additional unit of that thing. So the more we have of something, the less precious every additional bit of that thing is. Okay. And the so-called marginalists are going to use this to explain a lot of things, like a lot of aspects of human behavior, right? We ask complicated questions like, uh, why do people work or why do people not work? You know, marginalists will say, well, people work when the marginal utility of their time is less valuable than what they're going to get paid for their time. People don't work when the marginal utility of their time is more valuable than what they would get paid otherwise, you know? Um, it's as simple as that. So we don't work for pleasure. We don't work because we're good at something. We don't work because we have to necessarily. Um, these aren't necessarily great explanations. Um, we only work when there's a marginal utility versus um, that, that's being traded in some way. The same with why people trade. Um, any type of behavior like this, they're going to try and explain it using, mar using this marginal utility theory. So one of the points they make is in relation to diamonds and water. Um, this is a comparison that quite a lot of economic theorists make because uh, water seems like a very useful thing, right? Um, diamonds seem far less useful, okay? So why do diamonds cost more than water? Well, um, it seems like diamonds provide people with a higher level of satisfaction, you know, at least at the moment. Um, so in other words, the argument here is that diamonds have greater marginal utility, right? Even though water is a more useful commodity, it's not marginally more useful. Um, it's not providing the same amount of satisfaction um, because the, you know, there's so much water and it's so abundant that um, every additional drop of water is probably not giving us much more value uh, according to this perspective. However, every additional little diamond is probably giving us much more value. So neoclassical economics, as I've said, is based on a subjective theory of value. Um, we've studied other theories of value so far um, in this course, uh, such as the labor theory of value or the physiocrats uh, theory of value. Um, now, according to this perspective, the subjective perspective, goods don't have an inherent value. Um, labor doesn't determine, determine what the value of something is. If we wanna know what the value of something is, we have to ask a simple question. Um, how much does a person want to pay for it based on their individual goals? That's it. That's all. So there is no objective measure of value. The market will tell us what the objective measure of value is because the market is a way of summarizing and collecting together everybody's individual decisions, um, which then tells us how much things are worth. So marginalism and neoclassical economics in general uh, basically says if we want to understand prices, um, they're only determined by this interaction between supply and demand. It's a simple quantitative measure and that's it. You know, and that kind of means they're not asking a lot of the big questions that we've been asking in the last few weeks. So for instance, um, they're not interested in how the production process works, like say Marx was. They're not interested in why people like the certain things that they do, you know, why certain commodities are seen as status symbols and why certain commodities are not, you know, like Veblen, for example. Um, they're not even interested in the consequences of the economic system for, say, social stability, like Keynes was in the previous uh, topic. You know, so more or less, um, there is a fundamental assumption here that if we let individuals make free decisions, equilibrium markets will be created. So there will be an equilibrium market and everything will be as good as it can be. So um, we need to understand that marginalism as an idea um, arose in response to a certain political context, right? So in a lot of ways, we can see it as a response to the popularity of socialism in the 20th century. And uh, Marxism in, in many places became the dominant economic thinking of workers' movements, of revolutionary movements, anti-colonial movements, labor movements, and that sort of thing. Um, marginalism gives economic thinkers a way to attack this perspective and say, actually, um, if things aren't going so well, if there's some economic problems, it's the workers' fault. Let's blame them um, because their types of politics uh, we'll see, get in the way of the normal functioning of the market. So it's a way of saying, well, 
you workers might be asking for a better life, but it's the type of politics you're following that prevents you from getting a better life. Okay, so the basis of this argument is workers, or if they get into, have, into power somewhere, if they become the government, the government is interfering with market equilibrium, is making things worse. So another important thinker in this perspective is Friedrich Hayek, who wrote the book, The Road to Serfdom. And in The Road to Serfdom, Hayek is arguing that government control over the economy would basically lead to us being slaves. We would get enslaved over time. And Hayek's criticism um, is a criticism that's being made in response to two big success stories at the time. Firstly, the economic success of the Soviet Union and its central planning model. Um, the Soviet Union industrialized faster than any other country in the world up to that point. And that was one of the critical things that allowed them to you know, win the Second World War. You know, they were probably the most important, definitely the most important country in terms of deciding who won the, first, the Second World War. Um, and economic foundations of that were central planning. And then on top of that, we have Keynes, who we've already studied, and Keynes' ideas of economic management uh, were becoming ascendant in the countries that didn't follow socialism. Um, so the capitalist countries were still turning towards government as a way of managing the economy. You know, so Hayek is going to critique this and say, actually, I think government should do only a very small number of things. Firstly, uh, we could protect the environment and regulate special chemicals. So Hayek realizes, okay, some things are just super dangerous and we've got to be really careful about those things, radioactive stuff or highly poisonous chemicals or things like that. And we've got to protect the environment because without the environment, capitalism can't exist, right? Next, we need confidence in markets. And because we need confidence in markets, we need to prevent fraud. People need to have confidence that what they buy is what they buy and they're not being treated, uh, tricked or cheated or anything like that. All right. Lastly, um, Hayek wanted some kind of social safety net uh, to take care of people who fell into extremely unlucky circumstances uh, like poverty and stuff, um, but not a sufficient safety net to create a disincentive for people to work. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So one thing about Hayek is that everybody who lived at the same time as him thought he was pretty crazy, right? Um, almost no government paid attention to Hayek when he wrote this book, right? Or indeed, nobody paid attention to any of the other neoclassical thinkers because this idea of free markets was completely discredited at this point. You know, there were huge economic crises, uh, complete depression collapses in the 1890 and 1928. Um, and the result of both of these events um, was massive war <laughs> just as soon, soon, uh, very soon after them, right? So nobody was really sprouting the gospel of free markets at this point. Um, as we discussed in Keynes last week, these type of thinkers needed to wait until the oil crisis of the 1970s and the early 1980s uh, when everybody was looking for new economic thinking um, and a lot of people turned towards Hayek's policy ideas. So one of the concepts that's an interesting one in this way of thinking is what's called Pareto optimality. Um, you'll see it in uh, a lot of um, arguments about neoclassical economics. And it comes from Vilfredo Pareto, who's both an engineer and an economist from Italy. Now, this is a situation where nobody can be made better off without anyone being made worse off. Now, for Pareto, this is the best type of situation. Right, so any, any situation where nobody can be made better off without somebody being made worse off, um, we should try and alter that situation. Now, the problem with this is that, you know, we've probably achieved this state many times, but not necessarily been happy for it. Let's give some examples. So if one person holds all the land and all the wealth and everybody else is enslaved, it is true that nobody can be made better off without anybody else being made worse off, right? So it's interesting that Hayek um, in his previous you know, suggestion was saying, oh, well, the end result of government is apparently slavery, but uh, Pareto optimality um, does not necessarily attack slavery either, does it? Okay, next, um, in a perfectly equal society, it's also true that nobody can be made better off without making anyone else worse off. So let's imagine we live in a, you know, a completely equal society where everybody has the same amount of money, um, everybody has the same wealth and income. Now, in this society, 
nobody can be better, made better off or that anybody made worse off. Um, so even though Pareto is often cited in favor of the existing form of capitalism, um, it is true that his theory could be used to support anything from a highly communistic society um, all the way to a completely unequal society where one person has everything and everybody else has nothing. And what this really shows is that there's a big problem inherent in the neoclassical perspective. Um, distribution is treated as if it's irrelevant, as if it doesn't matter who has what in the economy. Right. So politics and distributional politics in particular um, is seen as unimportant because these people are basically thinking of the world like an engineer thinks of the world. These people are thinking of the economy not as an interaction of human decision making processes, not as something embedded in the society, not as something government helps to operate. They're thinking of the economy like a machine that works by itself. So monetarism is the last big component that we'll talk about that's in neoclassical economics. And um, Milton Friedman gets the credit for monetarism. He was a Nobel Prize winning economist. Um, and this perspective is partly a criticism of Keynes and in particular, a criticism of Keynes counter cyclical spending theory. Now, what we need to remember from Keynes is that he suggested if there's an economic crisis, it's a good idea for government to spend money to counter the worst effects of the economic crisis. Okay, and Friedman is going to respond to this argument by saying, if we change the total supply of money, if we do anything to change the total supply of money, we're going to create inflation. Okay, and that's going to be worse than anything we do to resolve the crisis. So if we remember, Keynes was prepared to tolerate some inflation, um, but the trade-off for this is to eliminate unemployment. He saw unemployment as being a far worse problem. Friedman doesn't believe unemployment can exist. Okay, <laughs> that makes him a unique person, right? Um, in an equilibrium state. So what he's saying is the only reason unemployment exists is because we've prevented this equilibrium state from occurring. Um, we've done things like introduce minimum wage laws or allow workers to have unions or things like that. And if we get all these things out the way, uh, there will be an equilibrium state, there won't be unemployment, um, and then everything will be fine. So therefore, it's much better to control inflation and do things like removing factors that create a disincentive for people to work. All right, so why do we work is an interesting question. And marginalism has a not very interesting answer. Okay, um, we work because the marginal incentive to work outweighs the marginal incentive for leisure. Right, we work because we feel like it's we're going to get more out of working than just being lazy and staying at home. Okay, so this basically says, uh, well, all of this theory that maybe you could work just for personal fulfillment or ideological reasons, you know, maybe you work to serve the nation or maybe you work to serve the working class or maybe you work to serve your fellow citizens. These aren't reasons to work. Okay, Friedman looks at everybody who's ever done work um, for for reasons that are not, you know, um, profit maximizing reasons and thinks they're a bit crazy. Okay. So he says the standard assumption in marginalism is that we're going to be lazy unless we're forced to work by circumstances, right? Unless we have it, we're scared of the consequences of not working. And that's why he's going to say things like minimum wage laws or income support or price support or stuff like that, things that make our life cheaper and easier, things that make us less dependent on work, they're all terrible because they prevent an equilibrium state. So um, the policy implications of neoclassical economics. Um, now, lots of governments followed this perspective, in particular from the late 1970s to the early 1990s. And even after this, in many countries, not in all countries, and especially not anymore, but in many countries, neoclassical economics is influential in both academic and policy circles, right? If you're a believer in this perspective, you generally see the following arguments. People believe that free markets and free trade are good without question. They believe in removing regulation that controls the activities of investors and business people, right? People with money, according to this perspective, need to be free to allocate their money however they think is going to be most profitable. That's how we generate an equilibrium. Um, they believe in removing regulations that try to give rights to workers. So things like minimum wages, limits to working hours. Um, even in some cases, uh, you'll see neoclassical economists arguing against child labor laws because it distorts the labor market. 
you know, their argument is uh, if, if children are poor, they should be allowed to work. Uh, nobody should stop them, that sort of thing, right? Um, they also believe in minimum taxation and social spending, so the lowest impact of government possible, again, to defend this equilibrium position. But um, there's some problems with the theory, okay? So um, obviously I talked a little bit about the issues with mainstream economics in the opening lecture, in the introduction to political economy, uh, but specifically when it comes to monetarism, it's been unable to explain a lot of things ever since it became popular, right? So the most important one is there have been many cases where inflation occurs. However, the supply of money has not changed in the place that inflation has occurred, right? Now their theory is completely based on the money supply. If the money supply grows, that's what's gonna cause inflation. So how does inflation ever exist in a place where the money supply doesn't grow? You know, there's also cases of places where there's no interest rate at all. So Japan is a good, a good example because it's either had a zero or a negative interest rate at times. Um, now this should never ever happen in monetarism, right? Uh, according to the precepts of their theory, um, an equilibrium state if allowed, you know, should never ever lead to zero or negative interest rates. Okay, so this view that markets are inherently stable seems really hard to defend now, you know. It's not like they didn't have their chance. Everybody was listening to neoclassical economists for about, you know, 30 years and everybody did exactly what they wanted. You know, most countries adopted this policy framework. And the thing that people started to notice is the countries who most adopted this way of thinking were the worst affected whenever there was an economic crisis, right? So the countries that opened their economy the most were the ones affected the most, you know, whenever things went bad. So one point about science and economics does claim to be a science, you know, is science is supposed to explain the actually existing world, right? We're supposed to be able to make predictions on it, you know, now, one major criticism of neoclassical economics is that it's not actually based on the real world, right? These arguments that have faith in free markets is based on a world that isn't quite with us, right? So here's a critique by Nelson. He says, the priesthood of a modern secular religion of economic progress. Um, this type of language shows us that there is an increasing number of people who compare economics to a religion and say, well, it seems like you just believe in free markets and their success story you don't actually feel the need to test your beliefs, okay? And then the other problem is with this rationality assumption. Um, in the last couple of weeks, we've studied authors like Veblen and Keynes. And if you paid attention, um, you should know that there's all kinds of reasons to question this idea of the rational individual. You know, we've seen people do things because they're scared, they feel confident for no reason, they do some other stuff. Um, they're chasing status, so they're trying to copy the upper classes. Why? Because they feel social pressure from their friends. These are not rational individuals, right? So even if people can be rational, the economic rationality is not necessarily good for society at all. You know, what we've seen is that the goal of corporate profits being maximized does not have to be good for the rest of society. You know, it is possible for a small number of people to get most of the economic development. Um, there is no necessary reason this is gonna be good for everybody else. The other problem with neoclassical economics is its failure to anticipate or deal with crisis. So most recently in 2008, um, there were no academic and professional economists who really anticipated the financial crisis. And also academic and professional economists did not provide any solutions to it, right? Neoclassical economics did not have a solution to this crisis. You know, the only people who came up with a solution to it were the people who turned back to Keynes and said, okay, let's do some stimulus spending again. We forgot about that. We can still do that. We're going to do that because we don't want to just watch ourselves get destroyed, right? Neoclassical economics also does not deal well with the inclusion of new information. Uh, Galbraith, who we'll study next, says that economists obsess over market transactions and maths. And it's this mathematics section uh, that makes them look a lot like a science. But this is not the only type of knowledge. You know, last week um, when we were talking about Veblen and Keynes, I mentioned that uh, these are heavily psychological theories. And it's an example of you're taking from one branch of knowledge, psychology, and you're introducing it into the way we think about the economy. You know, so we're borrowing knowledge from lots of different places. The biggest problem with neoclassical economics is it says we can't do that. There's no borrowing of knowledge for anywhere. There's just maths and stats. 
and a bunch of assumptions. And that's how we understand the economy, All right? So um, Galbraith says, is there anything missing even from the hotly contested domains of modern mainstream economics? And, you know, some of the things he thinks it's bad that modern economics programs don't teach, but perhaps should. The history of economic ideas, okay? Um, what we've discussed somewhat in this course is one thing that's left out. Um, macroeconomic policy um, is the type of politics and policy that Keynes was talking about, where government manages the economy, manages trade flows, manages that sort of thing, manages the big picture of the economy. Um, and then the role of institutional context, so political, national, international structures and policy histories, things like what Veblen was talking about, you know, um, things like what Keynes was talking about, you know, um, these things remain important in understanding the way that the economy works, but you won't find them in most modern economic programs. So this leads neoclassical economics to find itself in a position where it's increasingly being discredited again, you know, um, the policy ideas behind neoclassical economics are seen as the reason that the Asian financial crisis of 97, 98 happened, and then the 2008 financial crisis. And the perspective also failed to predict both of these prices. So there's clear evidence in this in terms of the behavior of many governments after the crisis happened. Uh, this is how we measure the extent to which these ideas are falling out of favor. So when the 2008 crisis happened, the very most notable thing is that many governments, but you know, the two biggest governments, I guess, the United States and China, uh, spent a ton of money on stimulus packages. Right? picked up Keynes' book, read it again, learned that stimulus was a real thing, I probably already knew, right? And spent a lot of money on stimulus packages. And uh, China, for example, showed that it sort of responded from the crisis the best. Um, what defined the Chinese economy compared to many other economies? Well, it's the amount of state control over the economy. So it's not that China is a completely state controlled economy, but um, the influence of state-owned enterprises and the Chinese state in planning and shaping the economy was very big compared to most other economies. And so it seems like the opposite of what neoclassical economics suggested is good. You know, uh, big government is good. Planning is good. Um, state ownership is good. Um, this seems like they've lost the ideological battle here, you know, that the evidence was proving them wrong. And the result of this is a lot of people began to get interested again in what we call heterodox economic perspectives, right? So they're picking up Keynes, they're picking up Marx, they're picking up people like Veblen, and they're saying, well, we need to go back to look at this stuff and apply it to the modern context because there's a lot of information and a lot of knowledge that they have that everybody forgot about, but it's potentially still very useful. So I'm going to finish this talk with a quote from Schumpeter, um, who's another economist, who says that the assumption that conduct is prompt and rational is in all cases a fiction, but it proves to be sufficiently near to reality if things have had time to hammer logic into men. Where this has happened and within the limits in which it has happened, one may rest content with this fiction and build theories upon it. Right? And Schumpeter here is warning us, if we build our theories on questionable assumptions, you know, we can convince a lot of people, but that doesn't make the theories correct, right? That doesn't make them good theories, okay? So what he's suggesting here, I guess, uh, if we apply this quote and think about neoclassical economics, the only reason it's been so successful as a perspective is because lots of people agreed with it for a certain period of time, not because it's a good theory, right? It's popular, not necessarily good. It serves certain people's interests, but it's not necessarily good, right? Um, and such is it's not necessarily goodness that at the moment um, it's now facing attacks from lots of different directions and governments are mostly ditching these ideas um, that neoclassical economics advocated successfully, you know, for the last 30 or 40 years, those ideas are on the way out now. Um, and it's, you know, not completely clear which perspective is going to replace it. So thanks for listening, everybody. Um, I hope you enjoy that talk on neoclassical economics.